Good afternoon, and welcome to Jeff and the Rabbi. Well, great topic today, I got to tell you. And at first, when you, when, you, when you let me know the topic, I was a little, I was a little shocked. You know, Jason Collins, you know, the basketball player, for those who don't know, came out last week bravely to the world and said that he was gay. So, you know, I, I'm thinking about this. And, and by the way, it met with a, a hero's reception by right. the president, by everybody else. So I'm thinking, you know, how it used to be when I was younger. You know, even before I was younger, even like 100 years ago, what a hero was in this country. Right. Dwight Eisenhower comes back from the war. <laughs> right. We win the war. He, he meets with the president. Right. Uh, the ticker tape parade down, uh, you know, Times Square. And, right. you know, that's a, he was such a hero they actually elected him president. Right. So big. You know, even I'm thinking back, you know, what, what I remember from when I was young, even, you know, 1980, you know, right at the height of the Cold War. You know, at that time, if people don't remember, in the Olympics, we would have, our people would have to be got kids because they couldn't be professionals, so they were college kids. Where the Soviet Union, they didn't have any professionals because it was communism, they had the best hockey team in the world. We go up against their hockey team, our bunch of little kids, and I still remember Al Michaels' announcement, do you believe in miracles? Right. Our hockey team wins. Heroes to the world. You, you see the picture there, everybody's shouting, USA, USA. Right. Heroes. I meet with the president, biggest thing ever. Even later on, you know, with George Bush as president, uh, the, uh, the team wins the Super Bowl, they get a call in the locker room from, from the president. Things seem to have changed. I mean, uh, like, 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 you know, last year, a year ago, uh, right in the middle of the president election, president's election, all of a sudden the biggest hero there, a woman who's going to a, a Catholic university for law school, upset because the Catholic universities, after reading the health care bill, says we're not going to cover birth control bill because obviously we don't believe in that. She comes out and says, it protests it. A conservative talk show host says, that, you know, in a kind of derogatory way, you know, I mean, they would have to break their religion to cover this, this woman's, uh, you know, immoral, he didn't say it that way, he used a different word, immoral actions, protests it, gets a call from the President of the United States. Hero, she's a hero. She actually speaks at the Democrat convention. convention. A woman who her only thing that she's done is she won't pay her $10 a month for her birth control bills and wants the Catholic University to pay for it, and that's a war on women. She's a hero. She's taking a stand for where she like, believes she's in. A, she's, she's a hero now. Right. So now this, this one gets me the most. A basketball player, very mediocre or less basketball player, plays for 12 years, engaged to a woman, everything's fine, but now since the president and everybody else, the, being gay is it's in, it's, it's, it's more in than not being gay, comes out and says that he's gay. He's not even playing anymore. Comes out and says he's gay. Gets a call from the President of the United States. Yeah. And, and the same thing with Eisenhower or whatever. Right. The gay basketball player gets a good. Right. So my question is, do we judge a society by what we call a hero? Is that, how, is, is yeah. that where we're going? Is, if he is a hero today, what's tomorrow's hero? Well, I, I think it's, it's even more, right. more startling because he's not a hero at all. As a matter of fact, he's a total coward. I think that he's just the opposite. He is a total coward because, and that's why I think it's like high time that someone turns the lights on. You know, there's this dark closet going on. Right. You know, they talk about coming out of the closet. Like, I think we should put the lights on this whole thing because the reason he's a coward is because his coming out right. didn't require any courage. The reason it didn't require any courage is because he only came out after a climate has been created in society so that anyone who would criticize him, he could count on the fact that all of the pundits, including the president, will come to his aid. Well, there's nothing special about that. When Jackie Robinson wanted to play baseball, he didn't even know if the president would stand behind him. He didn't know any... People got up in the stands. They were screaming at him. There were people that hated his guts and their fellow teammates and so on and so forth. He didn't have all the press lined up in advance. Here he's got the press lined up in advance. He has um, general managers that are already have themselves professed their homosexuality. And, you know, I never use the word gay because it's a euphemism. And right. they're not really happy at all. But they're, the homosexuals, they, they come out. He knows he's got all these people already lined up. He knows that there's a huge machine. And not only that, the machine is so powerful that if anyone opens their mouth against him, he knows that they will be roundly castigated. So he's not a hero at all. As a matter of fact, he's totally irrelevant. But a hero, he's absolutely not. 
because he's not doing anything. He has everyone else intimidated. His teammates can't say anything, regardless of how uncomfortable they might feel. They can't say a word. They say something, they'd probably be kicked off the team. They'd be kicked off the team. So what, how heroic is that? What he's doing is basically taking his own stuff, forcing it into everyone else's face, and saying, you, you must, and for no reason, because he gained nothing by doing this, but, you know, he wants to live his private life, live his private life. But he has to make a public life, and he has to go to his entire team and say, you must accommodate me. Regardless of your feelings, you might have some personal feelings. Well, you're not allowed to have those feelings. You're not allowed so. to forget that. Yeah. <clears throat> you might, you know, there are such a thing. I just was on my way up here, and um, I stopped off on the ground floor, and I needed to use the restroom. I wasn't sure which one to use. So there was one of them had a picture of a man on it, right. and the other door had a picture of a woman on it. So I figured, I'm a man, so I went in the one with the man door. Uh, I was wondering, like, why do they have separate restrooms? What's the purpose of that? Well, I think you have a problem there, because we're one of the last places that has separate restrooms. Yeah. You go on most college campuses today, you have the man, you have the woman, and the other one, I'm not really sure. Yeah. In the middle. So you, you might be wrong with this, this argument. Yeah. To, to the best of my knowledge, I think the reason they have separate restrooms is because people are uncomfortable exposing their private parts yep. in front of other people that find an attraction to those private parts. So therefore, they put all the men into one bathroom, assuming that they don't really have an attraction to each right. other. And therefore, you can just go about your business and right. come in and go out. And they put all the women in the other one. They don't have an attraction to each other, and therefore you can come in and go out. But if I have to start using the restroom, how would the women have felt if I had walked in to the women's restroom downstairs? It's, it's a good point, because it yeah. is happening right, right now. That is a very good point. And, and, then, and, when I say, and the women say, I'm uncomfortable. I said, don't be uncomfortable. Guy would say, I'm a homosexual. I mean, is, is, so therefore, if you're not attracted, do people have a right to be able to expose, where well, they have to expose their private parts, use the facilities? Right. Can you, do you have a right to expose yourself and be shielded from other people that might have a prurient interest in your body. And if so, if someone's in a locker room and where everyone gets undressed and they shower and they, you know, that's the way it is. Right. So do you have a right to be in a room where other people will not be looking at you in a sexual fashion? In and the old days, I would say yes. And so what he, just, what he said is, you have no right to that. You have no right to your privacy. He didn't say, you're forcing me into a closet. He's saying, I'm going to put all of you back in a closet. You have no right to be comfortable in your locker room because you have to accommodate me, which makes sense because our society is all about accommodating the individual at the expense of the, well, the community, the right. mass, right? right? That's the way it is. And I just want to take it a step further. This whole thing is really a textbook case. This is a textbook case, and I want to describe how did we get here. And it's that, important. That, that's the question I'd like to know. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you one question now. How do we get to this How do we get here? And I want to describe that because the way we got here is very instructive because there's a Jewish angle in this. The Torah has a lot of concerns about certain things. And when you look at them, you'll find that the Torah is watchful for just these type of things. Right. There is a process, and the Torah watches out in this process. Now, the process itself is not bad. It is the same process that will normalize and actually even promote anything. Now, that could be a good thing. That could be a bad thing. That could be a neutral thing. Right. But the same process is always followed. Here's what happens. You take something that everyone can't stand. I hate this thing. You've decided, I don't want it to be like that. I want this thing to be a good thing. Why? Because maybe it is a good thing. Or maybe I just want it to be that way. Right. It doesn't matter. Right. You could, it could be a good thing or not. So everyone hates it. Everyone hates it. What do you do? You first have to change the name of that item. You have to give it a neutral, euphemistic name, preferably a positive name. 
would make so sense. So people always have derogatory names, like in various racial groups, there were derogatory names. No, 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 no. We have to start. You can't use a derogatory name. And you start to say, why should you use a derogatory name for this, whatever it is, item, group, event. And in, now, in order to stop using a derogatory name, you have to create a euphemistic name. And again, I'm saying the process is not bad. The process might be talking about something that is good, that needs right. to be normalized, but the process is always the same. It can be used for a group of people that need to be normalized because they're nice people. It can be used for an activity that maybe some people consider to be an abomination, like homosexuality is considered by many people who are as Bible followers. Right. So you take this thing, first of all, you change the name. Instead of describing where it is, you give it a nice euphemism. Okay, preferably something that's real positive, like they're gay. Yeah, that's happy, that's happy, yeah. happy and gay. Right. Right. Happy, gay, they always go together. Right. They give you a euphemism. Now, the next thing you have to do is, step two, is you have to inoculate people to the experience. So what do you do? You start to have these little exposures. I remember watching a movie many years ago. And in the movie, the, it's an action flick. Right. And, you know, people run around with guns killing everyone. Right. Okay? And at one scene in the movie, some, a couple of the guys, I don't even remember if they're good guys or bad guys, they kick in a, door, a bedroom door because right. they're, they're, the guy that they want is in bed in the room. Right. They're going to kill him. So they kick in the door. The guy jumps up in bed, and <laughs> they shoot him dead. Right. Okay? And that's it, and then they move on. It's a quick scene in the movie. The only thing is, that when the guy jumps up in bed, he and another guy ah. just sit up in bed, right. Right? right? And they are clearly unclothed, you can tell by the, you know, at right. the time, only to the waist, but right. you know, you could tell. Right. Had nothing to do with the movie, had no bearing on the movie, had no, right. the plot, but nothing. Just that in there. Snuck right. that in just there. snuck it in there. Where is it there? Do one, and, and everyone, of course, is watching the movie, goes, <laughs> right? And then the movie moves on and it goes back to killing people and doing whatever it else. Stuff. Right. And nothing whatsoever to do with the movie. The guy that was in bed with had no, no, no previous, didn't show up anywhere previously or right. anything like that. They start doing these little placements here right. and there and here and there. Right. So that everyone starts to get a little inoculated. It no longer shocks you. Less shocking each time. Yeah. Less shocking each time. Okay. Once it's gotten to the point where it's no longer shocking, then you start to create positive images for that person. Right. right. Not only is it no longer shocking, but you start to create the positive image. So what you do is you find a hero in your movie, and then you add the fact that the hero in the movie also happens to be like that. Right. Whatever that might be. Right. Okay? Now people start to have positive identification with that person. So whereas first it was shocking, now it's neutral. Now it actually starts to be, I have positive. Oh, people like that can be very positive. And you start to have more and more placements. You write these characters into more of your uh, novels and your movies and so on and right. so forth. Okay. Then, then uh, already now it's starting to get more positive. Then you say, and if anyone would be critical of that, then if someone is critical of that, then you castigate that person very strongly, come out against it very strongly, until you're now at the point where this guy, Jason Collins, says what he says, and everyone lionizes him as a hero, but he's not a hero. He didn't accomplish anything. He didn't do anything, anything bold. He just is taking advantage of, um, you know, of, the, of the times, and it's just another, uh, another uh, event where... He's not only taking advantage of the times, but he's probably promoting himself because he is assessed at this point that this will move him forward. He's got maybe nothing else going on, and this is a card that, that he can play. Now, what does the Torah got to say about all this? Because that's the question. Because what you just described to me is, is, is the progressive playbook. That, that's exactly how it works. And I don't care what it is. I mean, it doesn't have to do just with being gay. It, it, right. With, with everything. And even with good things. I mean, truthfully, with, with, with you know, legalizing marijuana. With legal, right. it, it's the same playbook. That's right. So that's there right. has to be something in the Torah that right. talks about this. And thing. it could even be good things. Right. It's the, oh, the, the, the process is just a process. The process is neutral. Right. You can use it for anything you want. 
right? And, and as a matter of fact, if it's used for something positive, you take something negative and you hearken back to that all the time. Yeah, look, yeah, yeah. Civil rights, right. homosexuality, civil rights, homosexual, and civil you rights. you hear that all the time. Right? All the time. It's just, it's civil rights. Now, of course, it's not a civil right because... Because you choose to be black. <laughs> people are black. Right. That's just the way they are. Right? right? So you cannot... So, you know, nowadays they say you can't discriminate against a group of people just because of the way they are. They'll say, well, this is the way they are. And it's, no, this is something they do. It's something they do. It might be the way they are, but it still is but something that is an they action. do. Obviously, they were right. talking about right. It's an action. It's something that you do, even if it is the way you are, which means that you like to do that. That might be fine and dandy, but it's still something that you do, whereas blacks just are. It has right. nothing to do with anything they do. The guy could be sitting doing nothing. He still is. Anyway, the Torah is really sensitive all the way back to the beginning, like with the euphemisms mm -hmm. and things like that. The Torah is very sensitive about the way we talk about things. For example, there's a verse in the Torah um, that uh, the, a person shall not mention the names of idols v'shem elokim acherim lo yizacher al picha lo yishama al picha shouldn't mention them it should never be heard in your mouth so for example let's say there would be uh, an idol a popular idol called mercury right right so Torah says don't say the word mercury don't ever say the word Mercury. Right. Even if you go to buy a car and the car is called the Mercury, Don't say call it, it the, the M car. Right. Right. The Torah would say, come up with another name. Don't even say it. So where's the Torah fight, starting fighting the battle? All the way back at the euphemism right. stage. Right. It, you know, the, if it's bad, then your battle should not be fought on the acceptance stage after the person is already normalized and, and, and everyone happen. is seeing. Go all the way back to the euphemism stage. Don't say that word. Can't even mention the word. And not only that, you're not even supposed to have euphemisms for it. The Torah encourages actually derogatory euphemisms. If there are things that are bad, we are supposed to never mention the name. And if we do mention the name, we're supposed to create a derogatory euphemism. Right, okay. Well, that's interesting. We're supposed to. Is there an example of that? Um, yeah, for example, uh, in other religions, um, certain characters that are identified with other religions. We don't believe don't in understand. Judaism that, right. that God would ever have a son. And therefore, whenever we refer to the people that some people right. call son, the person that they call the son of God, right. there's a, like, you know, they, they, the name Yoshka. Mm -hmm. Yoshka. Yoshka is, uh, you know, there was a guy in, in Germany, not recently, like a Prime Minister or something, Yoshka, right. Yoshka, some, Yoshka really means Joey. Right, really? Right, yeah, something like that, right? Oh, yeah. So it's like Joey, it's like a, like a you know, derogatory nickname, you know? know? know so that. we're encouraged to use that because it keeps us distant. We put great stock in fences, fences around the law. So there's a law. This is bad. So for example, um, we, uh, we don't allow uh, sexual relations between people that are not married to each other. Okay? Right, right. Well, guess what? We don't allow them to touch either. The rabbi stepped in and said, don't even touch. Guess what? That's a real fence. The rabbi right. said, you can't even look at a picture. You're not supposed to even look at the pictures of that. They, guess what? Not only are you not supposed to look at a picture. You know, if there's a woman, let's say, that a man's not allowed to be married to, he can't smell her perfume. He shouldn't look at her, not supposed to gaze at her. You know, watch your eyes. Why? Did the Torah say, watch your eyes? No. The Torah said, don't do the relationship. And that would probably lead you to the But where do we don't start at the relationship. We move it way, way, way back. The Sabbath. The Sabbath. The Torah says, uh, don't strike a match on the Sabbath. Not supposed to light a fire on the Sabbath right. day. It says, do not light a fire in all your habitations on the Sabbath day. The rabbis came along and said, you're not allowed to touch matches. Oh, well, can't handle matches. You know why? Right. You're, never gonna light, you're not going to light a match if you can't even touch them. touch it. That's true. And where is the whole Torah's battle on the Sabbath? It's all about do you touch matches or not touch matches. And that way, the whole fight is over. Do we, you know, the struggle, the internal struggle is all about right. do I handle matches or not? Well, therefore, you know, that takes 
that takes the light and the fire completely right. out of the picture. So that's what we're all about. We're all about the very sensitivity. Right. We're about the terminologies that are used. We're about exposure. We're about becoming inoculated to things. So in other words, long before we get to the point of the battle, right. we realize the process, that the process starts off with the way you talk about things and the attitudes that you have and the placement. What are the visions, the images that you see? Well, now how do you relate that then to the homosexuality situation or, or with Jason Collins? Should people, where should that have stopped? Where should that not have gone? Should we never got to the situation where we normalize that? And, and how would that have been done? How that would have been done would have been that um, everyone, the truth is, it really is not a homosexual issue. It's a sexual issue. Okay. It's a sexual issue. The truth is, you know, talk about Eisenhower era, right. and I've mentioned this before, everyone, everyone should, should put their sexual relations back in the closet. Well, have you heard what, uh, I don't know if you heard what the president said uh, uh, in his speech the other day, he, was, he gave a speech to Planned Parenthood, he says where that other party, people want to take us back to the 1950s. Right. Is that bad? Right. I mean, Again? this is 2013. Right. So, you know, what, rest. what really, you know, what really was, was, was different about um, 1950s, and, you know, people can talk about positive or negative, but one of the things that you couldn't do is you couldn't do whatever you wanted in the street in front of everyone else. But you can now. In the 1950s, you probably could do whatever you wanted in the privacy of your own home. Some would say maybe you couldn't. I don't know about that. But... Um, now, it, but what you didn't have was the ability to force it on other people. And why is this? Why, why should we go back to the 50s? Because there is no way to stop it. What will continue to happen is, once the ball is rolling, so that which was an abomination becomes neutral. That which becomes neutral becomes admired. That which becomes admired, anyone, like right now, if, and if I am to get up, let's say I get up right now and I say homosexuality is bad. You are a homophobe, you're a hater, you, and all this type of stuff. You're lucky if that's what you get. It might I'm be worse. Sure, yeah, I'm sure we'll get all that type of, uh, you know, reaction and all that. So, right. you know, of course, no one's willing to say those words. I mean, it is an abomination. I don't know if I hate homosexuals. I don't think I do. But probably would be accused of that if I say that the act is an abomination. And of course, if I say the act is, and where do you know that from? Because if I say the Torah says it, well, then I'm just a Neanderthal. I might be excused for just being a Neanderthal Bible believer. But okay, either way, though, what happens is it's never content to stay there. See, that, that's my issue. Homosexuality is not my issue. That's my issue. Okay. What you just it's said not, there. It's not it's never, it can't stop. It can't stop. The reason why is because there is a proverb from King Solomon. King Solomon said, Mayim genuvim yimtaku, stolen waters taste sweeter. At this point, That's actually a very good one. sexual activities that once upon a time were considered to be so off limits are, are now on every billboard as you drive down the highway. Right? And therefore, it's not shocking anymore. And you know what? It's not exciting anymore either. So, so more and more people have to go. They go look for something that breaks ground. So homosexuality was the breaking of ground. But you know, guess what? It's going to become so normalized that it won't be. And that's when the children will be brought into it. When right. the children are brought into it, because at that point, just as in ancient Greece, it will become lauded and people will write beautiful poetry and, and, and great treaties about how wonderful it is when an older man takes a, young, a boy under his wing and educates him into the way of the world. And of course, ultimately, when you get to that, then society just crumbles. Well, I mean, but, but, but the progressive argument, as I could see coming from that, is we've gone so long, so many years repressing this, and these children <laughs> have been abused and because of homosexuality, that a good thing would happen is now at least a mentor, an older man, a mentor, could come and, and help them through this so that maybe, you know, the age limit, at least with boys, with men, would go down to maybe 15 or 14 or 13 because they're going to have to go through these troubled times alone. That's not a good thing. But I think more so than just the forbidden fruit type aspect that you're talking about, and 
pardon the pun, fruit thing, I didn't mean that, is that, um, <laughs> you know, it's pretty good. Gosh, I, I got to give you credit. You made a long I time. I really, gotta, I, really I really give you credit. That's, you know, this good. guy is self, -con Mr. Self-Control. If you only you. knew <laughs> how much self-control that did. I, I've been pretty well to make this long. But excusing that part, I think the whole nature of progressivism is that we're not here to change so the marriage is between a man and a man and a man and a woman, but what about the man who likes two men and the woman who likes three women and the dog and the cat and the beast in the field? Right. So I just think the nature of progressivism is such that it, that's where to. we're going. It absolutely has to. But I'll tell you, but the, the reason I really wanted to do this is because we need to be on the lookout for these things as they, as they show up. Uh, when bestiality makes its move. It, the reason bestiality hasn't made, you know it hasn't made a move just yet, is because there's no euphemism for it. When you first hear a cute nickname for people that have relations with their... I'm thinking of some right now. No, yeah, whatever, it, whatever it might be. But when you come up with a cute nickname, right. then, then you'll know it's on the move. Right. And then it has started, and that's where we all have to look at this. There's so many interesting little things. I just heard recently, you know, the government allowed the morning after pill for 15-year-olds. Yes. Okay. So the news story said for women as young as 15. Yeah, okay. it, didn't, it didn't say for girls. Little girls. For <laughs> girls at the age of 15. Now, why they choose to say women as young as 15? Well, if it's for women as young as 15, then it's a, it's a, it's a noble thing. It's a noble crusade to help with these poor women who are, you know, 15, like at least they can right. get access. They need it because they're women good who point. need this thing. Very good now, point. why didn't I call them girls? How many times, other than in a sexual context, how many times do you talk about 15-year-old girls as women? I, I can't recall you know, another time. When it's a soccer team of 15-year-olds, it's called a girls, soccer, girls team. soccer team. Yeah, without a doubt. Right? They don't call it a women's soccer team. Women is for 25-year-olds, right? right. Women's true. soccer team is women are like usually after college, yeah. right? Girls soccer team, okay? Right. Girls point. this and girls that 15-year-olds in every other area of life are called girls. Unless you want to get them access to the morning after bill, then they are women, they are women. as young as the age of 15. Now, one of my rabbis pointed this out to me, of blessed memory, pointed this out to me nearly 30 years ago. You know, and said, and when referring to young women, said, don't call them young women, they're girls. They're girls. When they get married, they're women. Before that, they're girls. Very right? good point. He said, this is all, he was on to this, and you have to look at this little terminology. Of course, if 15-year-olds if become women, so then what's the big deal of some guy he, you know, uh, taking advantage of a 15-year-old. She's a woman. Right, totally different. Right? Totally. And a boy. When boys, when 12-year-olds when become young men, right? right. Well, then it's okay. I can young men, it. you know, it's, it's okay. Well, I, someone, someone asked a question. I think this might be one of, one of the most important things. That what do we do now? Because how do you approach and teach your children about homosexuality is a great example. When we have to teach them, they have to be tolerant of other people. So how do you teach your children when, with all that's going on on TV about homosexuality? Should they not be tolerant? Should they not tolerate uh, Jason Collins? What do we do? Now? In the Jewish religion, how do you teach your children? Because so, let me tell you how they're getting taught in public schools. Yeah. Five years old, they're getting taught in public schools that there's a boy and a boy, or there's a boy and a girl. There's, there's, there's no difference. Right. How, how would you teach them? Right. So I would teach them that they have to identify people who are, uh, who are oppressing them is to turn this whole thing around. That by you forcing your private right. business onto me, that is offensive to me. You've invaded my space. What you want to do in private, you can do in private. But you have to get out of my space. You have to tolerate me. Why do I have to know about, have to talk about, have to, why do I have to acknowledge what you do in private? Why do I have to? The only reason I have to is because you are demanding something from me. You are demanding of me my acquiescence to what you're doing. And you can't demand that of me. You have no right to demand it, and I'm not going to give it. If you ask for it, I'll tell you I think it's an abomination. If you don't ask for it, 
and you want to stay in your private realm, then I won't say anything. I'm not going to walk around, walk in, I don't walk into the classroom every day saying homosexuality is an abomination. But if someone comes in the classroom and says, I am a homosexual, then I say homosexuality is an abomination. The problem with that, and it, it sounds great. And, and, and I'm going to gonna lock say. me up. Well, <laughs> I mean, if he's not going to a religious day school, and if he's going to a, a public school, he's going to be suspended from school. I mean, that, that's, that's a reality. He, right. And he might be expelled from school. He right. might be dangerous. He might be viewed as a danger to the other children because he's so intolerant. That's right. And you know what? Once upon a time, if you said that Stalin wasn't a nice man, that goodbye. I hope you enjoy Siberia. But, that's yeah. the, but that is what progressivism is, and that's what our society is. People are getting fired from their jobs. People uh. are not getting advanced in their jobs. Or, you know, they're, they're pariahs in the community. That's right. So how, how do you tell your children you're, you're not a bigot? Right. You stand up for the fact that you, so you know I read books and I have my children read books. For example, Jews who lived in under the communist regime, right? And Jews who lived under the communist regime, and yet believed in their belief system. They believed in the Torah, right? And they even there were even people that kept the Torah under right. like ridiculously repress repressive regime. And what you tell people is that you have to do what you believe is right. That's a good point. And you cannot expect that the world is always going to honor that. As a matter of fact, many times if you do what you believe is right, the world is going to hate it. Now, you know, when the guy was keeping Shabbos, he wasn't walking into the Soviet school and demanding, I demand of all of you that you sit here while I wrap my tefillin. But he did demand that in the privacy of his own home or in the privacy of his synagogue, he could put on his tefillin. He demanded that much. And when the society wouldn't, would deny it of him, this is who I am and this is what I'm going to continue to do because that's my values and I answer to a higher authority. We have to realize, see, we Jews have been repressed by many societies. We don't expect that society always sees things our way. So we're not shattered by the fact that the public schools um, are coming up with these uh, ideas that are antithetical to our belief system. We say, well, we had a good run. It was good for a while. Right. Went down the tubes, just like every other country That's went like down the tubes. Ever been. Huh? Good point. Good point. I think this was a, was a great discussion. I hope we don't get boycotted. That's the only thing I'm worried about, you know. No, I hope that at least they watch it first. Then they right, can boycott. They boycott. And if they do, they like they they email and Facebook a lot of other people that you're boycotting because hopefully that'll get more people to watch us. Very good point. Very good point. Great discussion. Great argument. And I think yeah, you know, it's it's something that should invoke discussion outside of the show because right. it's a, uh, <clears throat> you know, you can't be scared. You can't be scared if you to, to view your opinions just because society and Today's society says something, this is the direction we're going, doesn't mean you have to change your beliefs. And remember, if you've decided not to watch this show again, please don't just stop watching it. Tell everyone you know that you're not watching it anymore. Very good point. Very good point. <laughs> All right, for those of you that will be back, we will be back next week with another great episode of Jeff and the Rabbi.